Now let's look at the other kind of private equity that's out there, which is distressed or special situations investments. What do you mean when somebody says that you're in distress? You're in distress when you are not being able to meet a certain commitment, which for companies means that they're not able to meet their interest or principal payment requirements. It's when they're close to default or when they're close to bankruptcy is when the company is said to be in distress. Now, when the company is in distress, it obviously means that you can get that company or you can buy that company at a very, very cheap value, which is you can buy a distressed asset at a distressed value, which is what causes this particular asset class to be very mouth-watering for a few or for people who can basically go out there, buy a distressed asset, turn it around in the sense make it profitable or the other thing to do with a distressed asset is basically break it up and then sell it in terms of the asset value that's available. Sometimes distressed assets you can get for as low as 5 to 10 paisa even on the book value or the asset that is available. Now, basically, you can either buy a distressed asset and reorganize it or you can liquidate it or sell it as per the assets is what I mentioned to you before as well. How do you know when an asset is distressed? Basically, loans which are rated by rating agencies out there, which are rated at BB and below, are distressed. And the metrics that these rating agencies used to declare an asset or a company as distressed is they use metrics such as debt on EBITDA, which basically shows how high your debt is compared to the operating profits that the company generates, or it uses interest coverage ratios, which is basically your EBITDA upon interest to show if the company is capable of paying the interest cost by the operating profit that the company generates. If these metrics do not fall into place, the rating agency will in a sense classify the debt of that company as BB or below, which basically means it's not very stable right now. And thus declaring the company as distressed. Now, distressed debt investors, remember, are the people, all debt investors or debt holders are basically the first to get the money back from the company. Once the company has paid back the debt holders, do the equity holders come into the picture? Thus, debt holders have a very, very important and crucial role to play and they have a very large influence on the company. Debt holders can basically take over the company, control the company, strategically change, modify the company. It's what we call an SDR or a strategic debt restructuring. Or they can do a CDR, which is a corporate debt restructuring, and try and ensure that the company is capable of making back its debt payments appropriately at the right time. And while the company is placed in CDR, there is a certain amount of interest moratorium on the company in which the company does not have to pay its interest liabilities. Now let's move on and try and understand what is or what kinds of distressed and special situation investments that are out there. One can make an investment in a debt security or an equity security of a company which is under financial duress. Now, a distressed company is what is referred to as Chapter 11 bankruptcy, uh, which is basically in really high need of reorganization, which is basically sell off the assets that are not making money or which are leading to excess costs on book, uh, reorganize the company completely. Or basically you can declare a chapter 7 or in India what is called as the use the surface act uh, 
by using that act, what you can do is strip out, don't look at the company as a operating model, but look at it as an asset model, which is basically sell the land for what its cost is, sell the vehicles for what its cost is, sell the buildings for what they are, if there are any plants, look what the machinery would be worth and accordingly liquidate the entire assets of the company to derive the value back. Again, how does one know that the company they're buying into is distressed is basically through the rating that a rating agency provides. If it is BB or below that, it basically implies that your company is under distress and the kind of metrics the rating agencies use is debt upon EBITDA or EBITDA upon interest to define the interest coverage ratio. Now, distressed investors, the minute they take up a distressed company, they have to be very active in ensuring that either they, number one, turn around the company, uh, which is a reorganization, or secondly, they're capable of finding the right investors once they liquidate the company. So, for example, in the case that's currently running, which is the Vijay Malia case, all the banks are out there trying to find the assets belonging to Vijay Malia because it's his personal loan that's out there which he took for Kingfisher Airlines and they're trying to liquidate the assets that Vijay Malia holds to get back their debt. That in a sense would be basically in some way it's an example of a liquidation. Now let's move on to what is called as a secondary investment. A secondary investment is when a private equity fund has made an investment in a company and it's looking to make an exit out of the company. Now this could be because the private equity fund has not been able to achieve what it did or it could mean that they did achieve what they set out to uh, when they bought the company. Thus, when a private equity fund buys an investment of another private equity fund, it's called as a secondary investment. An LP could liquidate all its investments. So an LP selling their portfolio is a secondary deal. What it means is that when an LP sets out to liquidate its portfolio, it reaches out to all the private equity funds there and does an auction. In an auction, the various private equity funds bid for the assets that are available for bidding. This is called an auction process. What this requires is an extremely high level of due diligence, which is quick paced and fast. And because there is a certain timeline to the auction process and you also have to have a certain amount of competitive understanding because you have to understand who would be willing to buy that particular asset class at what price and accordingly you would put in a bid. Generally auctions end up with a much higher value as people overthink of what their competitor would bid for that particular asset. Now, there are extremely specialized investors that are out there in the secondary investment field. For example, there's Alp Investments, Invest. then there is Kohler Capital, there's Lexington Partners. Their entire focus and the way they've built their organizations is on doing primary investments in companies and then doing an auction process and providing secondary investments to other private equity investors. Generally, investment banks are used as auctioneers of these companies when the auction process does start. Now let's look at another kind of investment that's out there, which is called as a mezzanine investment. As previously discussed, the debt investors are very important and they're the first people who have to be paid off before the equity investors. When one invests in an extremely distressed asset, what happens is, is that the debt instrument is very high on risk. However, that high risk instrument on debt, high risky debt instrument leads to very high yields. Now, how can returns be generated? The way returns can be generated on buying such an asset is number one, you have what is called as a cash interest payment. Now, this cash interest payment is a fixed rate. 
that one gets on the debt or it can fluctuate with a certain index for example like Euribor or LIBOR. The other kind of interest payment that one can look for is payment in kind interest which is basically one can increase the interest amount by increasing the principal amount that is increase the debt on books of the company utilize it to buy more assets and thereby increase your interest amount and ensure that the company is capable of paying that back or the third kind of structuring which is what we're referring to is basically mezzanine funding which is basically a quasi debt equity structure which means you start off as a debt holder but eventually over a certain period of time you can convert that debt into equity and become an owner of the company which in a sense is that you kind of give the company time to get its operations intact and once those operations are intact you want to be an equity holder of the company mezzanine suffered before the credit crunch as senior debt was very easy to access and thus not a lot of companies wanted to access mezzanine funding because they didn't want their debt to be converted to equity now let's move on to a case study just to for you to understand how private equity is dealt with the person or the company out there that is looking for private equity funding in our case study is a leading brokerage house the brokerage house basically has a strong brand equity that's out there and it has a dominant position in both institutional as well as retail broking but it's looking for growth capital now and then there is a leading private equity fund out there and it's a large global private equity fund which is looking to make investments in the financial domain and thus finds our leading brokerage house and wants to make an investment. Now what happens is if the broking house manages to get the global private equity funding from the private equity investor number one it gets avenues for growth using the capital raised from the private equity investor it, the company is capable of giving its investors or the client base that it has more funding available to do margin funding and thus increase the volumes that they trade with for the brokerage increasing its avenues for growth Second thing that it can do is it can build a robust IT framework and that robust IT framework enables the company to probably do special situations such as arbitrage thus increasing the commissions that the broking company can earn. The third one that they can do is basically probably increase the kind of reports that they are generating. Uh, you know in, improve the quality improve the quality of writing the editorial content uh, improve the kind of um, saleability that is out there and reach a much larger client base thus increasing the revenue potential of the company that is how the investment from the private equity can be used to generate further growth the second important thing that comes in with private equity is that the broking company gets credibility once you have an associate company on your board holding equity of your company of global stature it immediately leads to enhanced credibility of the company thus attracting newer clients people who would come in thinking that they're working with a global firm would come in and work with the uh, with the broking firm the third thing that happens is basically it leads to deal experience. Thus the broking firm has already gone through one life cycle of parting with equity, going through the whole process in which an external party has come and done an operational due diligence, a financial due diligence on the company and the broking firm is now ready that even if it does need to go public, it will be capable of going public in the second round of investments if it needs further capital to enhance value for itself and then of course you have the investment bank value add which is basically that in 
it gets the best in class valuations because it has a global company on board with it so the investment bank when it takes the company to the secondary markets it is capable of giving the company the best in class valuations because of the kind of credibility that the global private equity fund has brought with it thus if the broking company decides to go second to the secondary market to raise further capital it is capable of generating or getting a much higher multiple than what it would have got in the in history now let's look at why a company decides to go private to fund get private equity or to go to the secondary markets let's look at the pros and cons of getting private equity investment versus going straight away to the secondary market and raising an ipo raising money through an ipo firstly let us understand that private equity is actually a tool for a pre ipo funding it's done in the pre ipo round what it helps is basically it helps in the company getting experience in what external investors would require of the company what is it to have an external investor on board what are the requirements of that thus getting experience from private equity is an important stepping stone to going to the secondary markets what's also important is that the private equity investor brings with it certain operational bandwidth private equity investors generally work with a certain particular sector and they can introduce industry standards they can introduce you to the right clients they can increase your client base they can introduce you to the right suppliers and thus private equity is a stepping stone by which you can improve your processes before you go into the public market round what's also now let's look at the ipo side what happens with an ipo is that you get a much larger base of investors out there who can invest small amounts of money for a similar stake in your company which means you do not have to go out there and convince one single private equity investor you can go out there and do a public launch and convince a whole mass of people and whoever is comfortable will invest with you what happens is by being listed you're not private anymore so what you've done is you've gone and announced to the world you've done a road show you've gone and marketed your company thus increasing probably the brand equity in some sense of your company what happens is with both ipo money as well as private equity money you can go and do an acquisition or you can go and fund your growth in a much larger way with private with public market funding you can launch what are called as esops which are marked to market thus your employees will know that if you issue esops to your employees they will have an incentive to perform as they know exactly what the value of their esop will be once the shares are listed and being traded on a daily basis on an exchange now let's look at what are the disadvantages of these two instruments the disadvantage of having private equity is that one needs to give the private equity investor an exit at least in 5 to 7 years which kind of is like a hammer on your head in some sense to perform in a particular way to you know be able to meet all the operational and financial metrics to give your investor the right and the appropriate exit what is the bad part of being doing an ipo and being listed is number one that you're on a mark to market every single day which in a sense depends upon the sentiment of the market in some sense and may not really depict the real value of the company you also have to become more quarterly focused because you're being judged on every single quarter that you declare your regulatory compliance has become so much more important and which is why you know it comes in with its additional pressures and makes you more short term focused versus being more long term focused which the private equity investment allows you to do the other important difference between a private equity investment and an ipo is that private equity investment comes at a much cheaper cost 
it comes at a three to five percent rate versus when you raise an IPO because you have to go for a roadshow you have to say pitch the product to a number of people the cost of raising those funds are much higher at about seven to eight percent now let's look at the global investment activity that has happened in private equity as you can see the amount of or the value of deals increased phenomenally until 2007 and then unfortunately we had the global financial crisis which caused the value of deals to fall in 2007 and then in 2000 sorry in 2008 and then in 2009 in the past three years that's 2010 11 12 the value of deals that were being done in private equity have more or less remained flat However, if one was to see the period of basically FI09 to FI12, one can see that the growth has been pretty high across geographies, which is Europe, North America and Asia Pacific, as well as the rest of the world. However, the private equity environment has not been as robust as what was achieved in FI07. Now, let's look at the kind of PE deals that were done over many years, the big deals that were out there. As you can see, the topmost deal that was done was for about $44 billion. It was done by Kohlberg, Kravis, Roberts and TPG, the largest or one of the largest private equity funds that are out there. The target company was TXU. This was done in October 2007, which is obviously at the peak almost of the, you know, of the financial markets, global financial markets. Then, if you can see, the next highest deal was $39 billion and it was done by the Blackstone Group. And this was announced in November 2006, again during the run up to the global financial crisis. The, one of the larger deals that was done way, way back in October 86 was done by Kohlberg, Kravis and Roberts in this company called RJR Nabisco. It was the first time, this was a $31 billion deal and was the first time that leveraged buyout was used as a model in private equity. In the other deal that's out there, which is about $32 billion, as you can see, there are a large number of buyers. There's Bain Capital, there's KKR, there's Merrill Lynch, and there's Global Private e Merrill Lynch Global Private Equity. There are basically three funds that got together to do a $32 billion deal in MCA. This is, in a sense, a, syndica a syndication deal, which means that a large number of private equity funds come together to part finance a complete deal. This is another way in which you can structure private equity deals. As you can see, a large number of deals have been done between $20 billion all the way to $44 billion in the history of time, which is pretty large investments.